All right. Well, good to see everybody. The room is done. What do you think about the partition wall being painted? Yeah, that's nice, isn't it? I wasn't sure how that was going to turn out. It's like a foam kind of material. And I, I wasn't, yeah, I, I was curious, but uh, the painters brought the Sherwin-Williams representative out here and he looked at it and gave a recommendation. So I, I think it's going to work fine. All right. Well, let's uh, open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We're going to spend just a few minutes finishing up chapter 10 uh, because there, there is, I think, a, an expression at the end of chapter 10 that can be a little bit challenging. So I want us to make sure we talk about that and think through that, and then we'll get into 1 Corinthians chapter 11. All right, so in chapter 10... Paul, well, let, let me back up. In, in chapters 8, 9, and 10, uh, Paul says that there are essentially two problems, two sinful things that the Corinthians were doing when they were eating meat in an idol's temple. Chapter 8 said the first problem is you're not regarding your brother. You're causing others to sin, which is making you sin when you do that without giving consideration to them. Secondly, in chapter 10, them participating in the idolatrous feast itself is idolatry. And Paul gave arguments as to why that was. So they should not be eating meat in the idol's temple. And I know we have some visitors who are like, what are you talking about? Um, that's some things we've talked about over the last several classes, okay? So, as Paul has now pointed out these two sins uh, in, in regards to their behavior, somebody might think, okay, but what about what about this meat being eaten in other settings? What, what if I'm not eating it in an idol's temple? What, what if I just want to go out to the marketplace where they sell this meat, like we've talked about, and I buy some of that and I take it home? Or if I'm having a casual meal with a friend? What am I just not supposed to eat? It, do, do, do these things apply everywhere? Okay, so that's kind of what Paul deals with in the uh, latter part of chapter 10. So look at verse 25, all right? Here's a general instruction. Eat anything that is sold in the meat market without asking questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. God made it. He intended it for you to, uh, for you to be blessed by it. Eat it. Go to the market. Don't ask any questions. Don't concern yourself about, well, was this meat that I'm buying offered to an idol or not? It may have been. It may not have been. Just buy the meat and eat it. There's nothing sinful in that. All right? Now, verse 27, he then presents a scenario. If one of the unbelievers invites you to his home, right, and you want to go, eat anything that is set before you without asking questions for conscience sake. It's the exact same wording as verse 25. Whatever you buy in the meat market, eat it, don't ask questions. If an unbeliever invites you to his home and you go eat the food, don't ask questions. It's the same wording. But, verse 28, if anyone says to you, this is meat sacrificed to idols, do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for conscience sake. All right, so someone who is at the dinner then says, hey, did you know that that meat had been sacrificed to idols? Now, here's the question. Why is he telling you that? Maybe because he knows you're a believer. Or okay. Maybe because, he doesn't maybe because his conscience is bothered by that, right? Or 
and, and you know, maybe he's overly scrupulous about this and his conscience is bothered, so he doesn't want you to eat it either. Okay, Kyle, you had another... All right. See, there's lots of things, right, that this could potentially be. All right. So if anyone says in verse 28, well, who is the anyone? Well, it might be a weaker, a weaker Christian who's with you, whose conscience would be defiled by eating that meat. In that case, what does chapter 8 tell us to do? Don't eat it because you might encourage him to sin. You might make him stumble. All right. It could be the pagan host is the one who informs you. Now, why would he do that? Well, oh, he's proud. In what sense? He's proud to be serving you meat that has been offered to an idol. Maybe he wants you to know, hey, I'm a religious person too, right? I, I know that you, you're a Christian, you know, whatever that is, but I'm a religious person too. Uh, see, I can prove it. I offered this meat as a sacrifice to, you know, to my God earlier this morning. All right, so maybe that's why he's telling you, or he might, and this is a sinister motive, but he might be trying to trip you up somehow. Maybe he's testing you. Maybe he's trying to see, oh, I offered this meat to, you know, Athena earlier. This, I wonder if he's going to eat this. <laughs> if he knew where, where this meat had been, I wonder if he'd eat this or not. Let, let's see. Maybe trying to influence him. Okay. Get away from that Christianity business. Come back to what you used to do before, right? So, someone informs you, this meat's been offered to idols. So Paul says in 28, don't eat it. But then he says, 29, I mean not your own conscience, but the other man's. If it's a weaker Christian who tells you, don't eat it because of his conscience, not yours. Your conscience is not bothered by this, but his is. Or if it was the host who could somehow be offended. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how that would work, but I, I guess we could theorize some way. Don't eat it because of the other person's conscience. Now, look at the end of 29. This is the expression that I think is a little troublesome. For why is my freedom judged by another's conscience? Now, at first glance, you might look at that and say, that's, that's in contradiction to everything Paul has said in the past three chapters, right? I'm not going to let my freedom be judged by somebody else's conscience. I'm going to do what I want to do. That's, that's kind of the way that reads, right? I mean, did you, maybe you didn't see it that way. But if you did, let's think about it in this way. Let's think about it in a slightly different way. If you go ahead and eat that meat after you've been informed that it was meat offered to idols, what are the people in your present company going to do to you if you eat it? They're going to condemn you. If it's a weaker brother who says, hey, did you know that this was offered to idols and you eat it anyways, what's he going to do? And what's he going to think of you? He's going to judge you. He's going to condemn you for eating that because you're not being as scrupulous as he is, right? Or if it's that host who's maybe trying to test you or trip you up, or maybe he's trying to show you that, you know, he too is a religious person and, well, you know, paganism that I do is just as good as what you're doing as a Christian. We can both be religious people together. Uh, if you eat it, then he might think, well, see, there really is no difference between what I believe and what he believes. I mean, if he's going to eat the same meat that I'm eating that's been offered to my idol, he must not care all that much about his God. Whatever course you take, if you eat it, you're going to be judged by your company. You're going to be condemned in your behavior. And in verse 30, Paul says, if I partake with thankfulness, if I eat with thankfulness and a clear conscience, why am I slandered. So what are the people in the present company doing to you if you eat? They're going to slander you. They're going to talk bad about you. So Paul says, I'm just not going to eat then. There's no way for me to do this and not be judged, 
condemningly by someone else. There's no good option for me here except to just not eat. Okay, that's, that, I think that's how we need to think about that expression in 29. Why am I judged by another man's conscience? Okay, whatever I do, I, I'm backed in a corner with no good option here if I eat. I'm either going to be condemned by the weaker Christian or I'm going to be condemned by the host or whatever it is. Everybody's going to make a judgment about me, so I'm just not going to eat it. I don't want to be in that situation. So, whatever you then, verse 31, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God, just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many, so that they may be saved. Okay. So. Before you move on, just go ahead. That, that conscience, you know, um, not for, let's see, without asking the, the question. The 20, sake, yeah, in 29, for, not your conscience, but the others. And for conscience sake, not for your own conscience, but the other man's. Right. My freedom judged by, I, I think it's also saying you don't have to adopt his conscience. Right? Yes, Does right. Mean, okay, for why would I have to adjust my conscience, my freedom, just because he has an issue but yes, my actions, but, but I don't yes. have to adopt his. Yes, I don't have to think like he thinks. Yeah. I'm just going to think like he thinks, so to speak, for now, right? I'm just going to adopt this practice for now because I don't want to offend him. But I don't have to change my thinking on the matter. Yes, that's right. Okay, Joseph. So in 27, it says, if one of the unbelievers invites you <clears throat> to dinner, you go and eat. I understand the point he's making. But earlier in Corinthians, it tells you you're not... You're not supposed to eat with unbelievers and so You think about chapter five? Yeah. Okay, no, it doesn't say don't eat with unbelievers. Look at it. Go back to chapter five. All right, look at verse nine. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral people. I did not at all mean with immoral people of the world okay. or with covetous or swindlers, for then you'd have to go out of the world. I wrote to you, verse 11, not to associate with any so-called brother if he is an immoral person, yeah. not to eat with him. Okay. So this is a Christian who is pursuing immorality in his life, and they're told not to eat with him. You can't be in fellowship with him anymore. Perfect. Okay. All right. Okay. Anything else? Chapter 10? Corey. I think 10, 13 is a huge one. It's always been one of my favorite verses. Ah, 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 that's my sermon today. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Make your point. <laughs> There's always a right choice. Yeah. And so whether you're tempted to get into a situation or, um, you know, you've got, there's, there's nothing that's, presented to us in a temptation that God has not either given us the strength to get us through it or found us a way around it. There's always the right choice. All right. That's good. That's good. And, and, and I am preaching on that verse today. So you'll have some other things to think about this morning. Okay. Yes. And we're not the only ones going through it. It's common to man. Ah, stop it. Stop it. <laughs> Quit talking about verse 13. You're, you're taking my bullets out of my gun. Kyle. I read it in a commentary one time. <laughs> <laughs> Verses here are specifically talking about this meat sacrifice to idols, but there is the, the principle here that we can take that because how often do we come in, in contact with this scenario? We don't, right? Meat sacrifice to idols is not something that we right. deal with. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, yes, we may. I had some <laughs> Muslim clients. They really liked me. I really liked them. They wanted to take me to lunch. So after <laughs> That's interesting. That's interesting. Okay. Generally speaking, though, Kyle, your point is right. Generally speaking. That's funny. Yeah. Don't tell her till we're done eating. <laughs> but. Oh, wow. All right. Okay. But, but yes, your, your point generally is true. Generally. You know, we need to be, we need to be able to take this concept or this principle. Right. And apply it in other situations. And we talked some about that on Wednesday night, about some pra practical situations where we might encounter this. Mary Gill? This I don't know that this applies to anything, but um, putting a person in a circumstance, it, what I did before we moved here, I worked with a lot of international people. 
And one thing that we would do is we would invite them to Thanksgiving. And I went over what everything was, and in my stuffing, I had some sausage. And I, you know, I said something, and I, as, as they were serving, of course, I, I guess he didn't listen or uh, whatever, but he took, saw, and he was eating it. And at that point, I thought, do I say anything to him? <laughs> <laughs> I, I right, him. yeah. So at that point, you know, that's, I don't, that's, you know, and I was, I was up front with it, but, you know, right. you know, do you say that that has told you? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's interesting. It's also interesting that you said Muslims who had offered something to idols. That, that's interesting. They, they were, yeah, I can't remember where, where I, they were I'd think that would be uncharacteristic for, yeah. for Muslim faith. Um, okay, so chapter 11, verse 1, which really should be chapter 10 and verse 34. Okay, if you want to think about it like that. Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Do you, do you see how that really belongs at the end of chapter 10? Okay, this is what Paul's example has been throughout all of these things. Okay, let's go to chapter 11 now, and let's talk about something that I've been thinking about for about four months. This, I, I've been thinking about today's Bible class for months, and I'm not kidding when I say that. Uh, I, have, I have compiled pages and pages here of material on 1 Corinthians 11, 2 through 16. Um, and, and it's really a whole lot of effort for a short period, right? We're only going to have a class or two on this, but uh, it was a good study for me. How many of you have visited congregations, maybe in other areas, and you've noticed ladies in worship wearing a veil on their head? All right. Some of us who lived in North Alabama for a long time, Jonathan, uh, and maybe others, you see this everywhere. It is not uncommon at all for ladies to wear a veil on their head during worship. And all of that comes from this one New Testament passage. There is no other passage that talks about this subject. It is just right here. So, Maybe you've been in that setting and you've seen a lady wearing one of these veils on her head and you've thought, I wonder where that comes from. Why is she wearing that? Well, we're going to talk about that some today. If you are a man and you are at a high school football game on a Friday night, if they still do prayer before high school football games. They used to do that when I was in high school. Uh, what do they request that the men do during the prayer? Where does that come from? Right here. It comes from this passage. Um, and I suppose that even an atheist person might do that because it's kind of become a social customary practice, I guess. But the principle that gave birth to that practice is right here. So, I don't know how much familiarity you have with this subject. You may not have any. Maybe you've never studied this before. Maybe you used to wear one of these. I, I don't know. But you may know that there is a lot of debate about this. There's a lot of different opinions on this teaching. Should a woman wear a veil or not? Uh, and there are some people who have views on this that are wide ranging, okay? Obviously, we're not going to settle that in a single Bible class, okay? But what we can do is talk about some of the concepts and principles that are uh, brought out of this passage that I think are important. And I've got a, a handout here that I'm going to give to you a little bit later in the class uh, that will present some of the different views of this passage. And you can read through those. I've put four of them on there. Believe it or not, there's at least seven views that I know of. Uh, three of them, though, I think are quite ludicrous, and I didn't even include them on the paper. Uh, I, I've included on this handout the four most generally accepted 
interpretations of this passage, okay? And um, I have one that I hold to. I'm not dogmatic about it. You need to study it. You need to think about it, form your own opinion. And if your opinion is different than mine, then you will join a host of millions of others who have an opinion that's different than mine, and that's okay, all right? So, chapter 11, verse two. Let's just work the text together. I praise you because you remember me in everything and you hold firmly to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But, uh, okay, right? Paul starts with a praise. You're doing a good job keeping the traditions that I've taught you. Okay? A spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down, right? So I think Paul is going to say some things here that need to be addressed, but he starts off with something positive. I want you to know, verse 3, that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. How many of you have the ESV? All right, what does it say there instead of woman? Wife. A man is the head of his wife, I think is the translation. I really like the ESV, generally speaking. I do not like it here. I don't think this should be translated wife. I think woman is the right translation. Now that's not because I'm a scholar or I'm a professor of these things. The word that's used there, the Greek word, it can be translated either way, legitimately. But when it says, a man is the head of his wife, it gives you the impression that the teaching of this chapter only applies to married women. That only married women have their man as their head. But the text also says that Christ is the head of man. Is Christ only the head of married men? No. So, I think this ought to be understood as women, generally speaking, not just limited to wives. Okay? Wayne? I want to go back to verse 2 for a second. You used the word traditions. Yes. Paul was teaching traditions is what you said. Right. Now, now well, that's what he said. <laughs> teachings. Yes. I look at teachings and traditions as very different things. Traditions are what you know, men in social groups might do where teaching that Paul is doing would be the Word of God or... All right. It, all right. So you're, you're making an important distinction. However, the word traditions in the New Testament sometimes does refer to the teachings of the apostles. Okay. okay? And not just man-made traditions. Let me show you that. Okay? So everybody go to 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and here's an example of where you see something that, uh, Wayne, we would call apostolic tradition, meaning teaching from the apostles, okay? So look at verse 15. I'll wait for you to get there, Wayne. <laughs> Wayne's pages are sticking together. <laughs> All right. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. All right. Do you all see that? Paul makes a reference to teaching that us, the apostles, had done. And it came either verbally or by written instruction, but he calls it traditions. Okay. The NIV says teachings. Okay. So... Traditions can either be from God, in the case of what the apostles are teaching, or they can be from men, which Jesus would often condemn the Pharisees for creating their own traditions and then binding those on people, things that God did not bind, right? So the word tradition is not a bad word uh, necessarily, okay? So Paul says to the Corinthians, you're keeping the teachings that I've given to you. Good job. However, and what I think he's doing in this passage is explaining why he's given a particular tradition that he gave. It seems to me that um, the Corinthians are doing what Paul's going to say in this context, but maybe they're just not understanding why. 
And so he's going to give some of the logic behind it. Okay? So, he talks about headship in verse 3. God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of man. Man is the head of woman. All right. Now, verse 4. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. Okay, let's think about the way this is worded. If a man prays with his head covered, he disgraces his head, his bodily head, or is this referring to his spiritual head, verse 3, right, which is Christ. Okay, Christ is the head, he's over man. And if the man prays with his head covered, he dishonors his head, Christ, not his actual bodily head. Although interestingly enough, the same word is, is used, but, but clearly that, that has to be what that means, right? Okay. All right. So men, should their heads be covered when they pray or prophesy? No. All right. Now look at verse four or five. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. Who is that? Man, according to verse 3. Man is the head of woman. So if the woman is praying or prophesying uncovered, she disgraces the man. For, verse 5, she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. Okay, this passage is going to talk about different lengths of a woman's hair. You will see in verse 15 that her hair can be long. You see here in verse 5 that her head could be shaved. And you see in verse 6 that her hair can be shorn or cut short. All right? You can have long hair, you can have short hair, or you can have no hair, shaven. That's what shaved means, no hair. Okay, so shaved is my dad and Marty. <laughs> okay, all right. So, the woman who prays with her head uncovered disgraces man. Okay, disgraces her head, man. All right. And then he says... In verse 5, 4, because she would be one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. Now, if you see a woman today, culturally speaking, if you see a woman with a shaved head, what do you think? No, that's not a shaved head, not chemo and hair fell out. She shaved it. I, okay, I mean, maybe she, if she's got chemo, she preemptively shaved, maybe. But... If you see a woman with shaved head, generally, what do you think? Avoid cancer. Not thinking about cancer. <laughs> They're wanting to be manly. Wanting to be manly, wanting to be noticed, wanting to stand out, wanting to be rebellious, perhaps, right? That's, that would typically be the reasoning, okay? Well, it was the same way in their time. So Paul is saying, if a woman is uncovered... Verse 5, it's basically the same as her having her hair shaved off. Okay? Now, verse 6. For if a woman does not cover her head, and of course that's talking about her bodily head, not talking about covering the man, not her spiritual head, right? If a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her cover her head. So here in verse 6, you've got a woman with long hair, but she's not wearing a veil. And Paul says, then you might as well just go ahead and cut your hair off because it's the same thing. All right? Everybody follow me. Or do you follow Paul? <laughs> okay. Corey. Okay, let's come back to that, okay? All right, now, another reasoning as to why Paul gives these instructions. Verse 7, 
For a man ought not to have his head covered, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Now Genesis 1.27 says both male and female are made in the image of God. Paul is not saying that women are not made in the image of God and they're no better than the animals. That's not what he's saying. But he is talking about the creative order and how that was followed. Man was made first, and the woman was made second, and from what was she created? From the man, right? And that's what he clearly uh, mentions in verse 8. Woman does not originate, or excuse me, man does not originate from woman, but woman originated from the man. That's clearly talking about when God took the rib from Adam's flesh and fashioned the woman. Adam did not come from Eve, she came from Adam. And so that's what it means uh, when it talks about woman being the glory of man. All right? Now, therefore, verse 10, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. All kinds of wild ideas about what that expression means. All right? Let me tell you the one I think is probably the most plausible. Flip over to the book of Jude. Because of the angels. Chapter one. Yeah, right. Yeah. If you're looking for Jude chapter 2, you're going to be looking for a while. Um, look at verse 6. Jude verse 6. Angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Why are these angels in Jude 6 going to be judged by God? Because they failed to keep their proper place. They uh, presumably were not happy with the station that God gave them, and they rebelled against God. And God says, fine, I'll take care of that. I think the expression in 1 Corinthians, because of the angels, may be connected to that idea. And I say that because of what Paul said in verse 3, talking about headship, right? God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of man. Man is the head of woman. There is an order that God has created. And there are some angels that we can read about in the New Testament who did not respect God's order. And God is going to judge them for that. So, man, woman... You need to respect God's order. Now, that's just one of the many interpretations that's given to that expression. I think that's the most plausible one, but um, you, you may have a different understanding of that. All right. So, Paul... Oh, okay, Wayne, go ahead. I was just going to say the wearing of the cover on the head for a woman then is a, I'm going to call it an outward uh, exhibit or show of submission. Yes, I think that's right. Yes, that, that's a good way to say it. All right. Now, verse 11. So th this, this is a balancing point to what Paul said earlier about man being the glory of God, woman being the glory of man. However, in the Lord, neither is woman independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as the woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman, and all things originate from God. Men, don't think that just because I have said that women are below you in terms of the order that God has created, don't think for a minute that that's something you can abuse. Don't think that that's something that you should, you know, hold over their head and, and, and be, um, be improper towards them. Because without her, you don't exist. <laughs> you, you, you have a mother, and you didn't come into this world without one. So don't think that you're independent of her, that you can be without her, because you can't. All right? So that's a, a balancing point to what he said earlier. So, verse 13. Judge for yourselves. Some translations say judge in yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Now, have you noticed 
how many times thus far Paul has told women to cover themselves when they pray or prophesy. Let's look back at it. Verse 5, Every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head. Should a woman have a covering on according to verse 5? Yes. yes. All right. Verse 6, If a woman does not cover her head, let her have her hair cut off. But if that is disgraceful, let her cover her head. So in verse 6, should she cover her head when she's praying or prophesying? Yes, seems so. Okay. All right. Verse 10. A woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. So three times thus far, Paul has said, women, cover yourselves when you pray or prophesy, as he said in verse 2, or, or verse uh, 4, rather. Julie. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, we're, we'll get there. Okay? okay. But I will tell you, though, that's an interpretation and it, I mean, of it. it. That, that's an interpretation of it. It's, it's not a, that's not one of those instances where it's saying, hey, the Greek word could be this or this. That's an interpretation uh, of it. Okay. okay. But I'll show you where that comes from. Okay. Go ahead, Dad. Right. It says nothing about singing. It says nothing about studying. So we're talking about in our worship service. Woman okay. Be wearing her veil. All right. These are, these are good questions. All right. <laughs> let's finish the text. And clearly, let me. Do you all want to spend another class on this? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, all right. All right. So let, let's work the text. We'll finish that. And then I'll, we'll, we'll do the handout for next time. And we'll talk about some of the different views. Okay. Um, Yes. Oh, yes. They're scattered all over North Alabama, Carol. Yeah, they're, they're all over. If you could get to the conclusion of it, we may not need more, right? But I realize well, it's, it's maybe. Not to get to. I know. All right. So three times up until this point, he has said in one way or another, a woman ought to cover her head. All right. So judge for yourselves. Verse 13. Is it proper? for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does it not seem that Paul is anticipating a negative answer there? Right? He, he doesn't present arguments about the order that God created. He doesn't say three times, ladies, you should be covered, and then say, but you know what? Just form your own opinion about this. Do whatever you want to do. That's not what he's saying. In fact, jump back to uh, chapter 10 and notice verse... Uh, 15. He, remember what we've just talked about, about meats, at, uh, sacrifice to idols and so forth. Verse 15, I speak as to wise men, you judge what I say. He, he's not saying disregard everything I've already said and just do whatever you want. He's calling upon them to take the information he's thus far presented and then reach a conclusion. And hopefully their conclusion should be the same that his is, right? That's what he's anticipating. All right. So judge for yourselves. And then he says in verse 14 and 15, Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her? For her hair is given to her, for a covering. But if one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. All right. Somebody might look at verse 15, where it says her hair is given to her for a covering and say, that settles it. Long hair. That's her covering. And I would understand why somebody reaches that conclusion. However, I think it's wrong. And uh, I'll just have to explain why on Wednesday. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.